Hi, I'm Anna Brnovitska, Head of Research at the Institute of Modernism, Moscow. The Strelk Institute invited me to talk to you about mass, his mass housing in Russia, and I will be talking for about 15 minutes, and after that we will have time for your questions. You can type them uh, into a live chat. I hope you see where exactly. So, uh, more specifically, my subject is uh, mass housing of the Soviet period, because this 70 years of the Soviet project was a time of uh, massive urbanization and modernization of the country. At the beginning of the 20th century, mo uh, Russia was mostly agricultural co country, and it ended to be in vast one of the most uh, important industrial nations. Uh, and as you can imagine, the housing problem was very serious one. Uh, the specifics of the Soviet system was that the state took the obligation to provide its citizens with homes. And uh, due to not a uh, very effective economy wasn't able to fulfill this obligation in full. So uh, people couldn't choose their homes. They had very, very, uh, very uh, little say in how they want to live. And they were mostly happy for every apartment they could get. But still. Uh, the state uh, took this obligation seriously. After the, right after the revolution, the private property was abolished. So the first step was redistribution of housing. And underprivileged families moved into good apartments of the bourgeoisie. That was, was first what happened. And that was the start of the Soviet phenomenal, phenomenon of um, communal flats, communal apartments, where every room was occupied by a family. So several unrelated families shared one kitchen and one bathroom. Of course, this solution was meant to be temporary. But what was to change? Uh, the Soviet theory of town planning considered the existing capitalist cities to be highly unsatisfactory. Uh, on the right, you see a picture from uh, the first book of the Soviet town planning on construction of socialist cities. And this is a photo of the central part of London, and the caption reads, nightmares of a modern city. So existing cities were considered to be nightmarish. Something, to, uh, something had to change. And from the start, not only planning, but research offices were established to find, uh, to develop new models of how people would live in the cities. Scientific research, then planning, then design in large state-owned offices. And there were three basic models. Uh, this is the same three models that you have in the present competition. The first is low-rise model. It was not very widespread. In reality, especially in smaller cities, there was still so-called private sector, where people build their homes as best they could by themselves. But in the controlled design and planning, low-rise model were used uh, in the situations where there were no resources for high-rise buildings. The obvious advantage of low-rise models is that you don't need expensive materials for it. You don't need steel and you don't need heavy machinery. 
So in the early 20s, when construction began after the pause, after the revolution and uh, the civil war, uh, the Soviet town planners uh, allowed uh, the model of uh, the garden city. So English model of the garden city or garden settlements. In the large cities, including Moscow, the whole areas were um, given to these settlements, and only in Moscow, over 20 such settlements were built in the 20s. And uh, in some of them, uh, like in this uh, Sokol settlement, every family got their own home. You can see that the plan is quite picturesque, but the plots, individual plots, are quite small, and each one was given to one family. It was a cooperative. It wasn't state-owned. In the 20s, it was still allowed to people to pay for their own homes. But there were still several types of repeated designs. So the state office developed several types of homes that could be built. And they were quite modest, but at the same comfortable. And what's important, they were mostly self-sufficient. They had water supply, but not a centralized sewage system or heated system. It was heated by the stoves. Uh, they had indoor toilets, uh, but with um, pit not uh, connected to some uh, sewage system. And what's important is that this kind of homes, they were small. This one, this house has three rooms and they were not designated uh, like bedroom or dining room or rooms that could be used for any purpose. But it only, it also has a glazed terrace and uh, some sheds for storage. And inside the house, there were also some places for storage. And it was uh, what um, differs them from standard apartments. This is another example, slightly bigger. And OK, you see that a bus tub is inside the kitchen. And it was uh, one of the widespread solution. In th this is another example of garden settlement. And you can see that there are bigger houses and one house on four individual plots. So the house is shared by several families. And it was considered to be more desirable not so petit bourgeois, but also not proletarian enough. Ide ideologically, the better solution was to build not garden settlements, but workers' settlements. Bigger developments uh, with apartments, not homes, uh, not houses for one family or even four families. So this is one of the examples uh, from the mid-20s in Leningrad. And uh, here you can see that we now have four, four stories, four stories. So, uh, higher houses were better than really low rise uh, in terms of the urban scale. And by the late 20s, there was a change from low rise to mid rise um, developments. And again, after the war, after the Second World War, where the housing crisis was at its worst. Temporarily, there was uh, a period for a low-rise housing again. So architects developed a number of repeatable designs 
to be built several times or many times over for houses for one family or uh, meant to be shared between two or four or six families. And what we still have from this period is this districts of uh, low rise housing on the outskirts uh, of the cities. And uh, they look very nice, actually. Uh, they have uh, nice courtyards. They look, uh, from the Soviet point of view, rather European. And they generally called or nicknamed German houses. German because uh, some construction workers uh, were prisoners of, of war and also because in its designs uh, uh, reflected um, impressions of architects uh, that uh, uh, were in Europe during the war. They were in the army and so small Polish or German towns and brought the, uh, the ideas with them. But if you look, if you look at the plans of the apartments, you see that they're very small, very small. Mostly it's two rooms apartments, plus kitchen, a bathroom, and toilet. Uh, and rooms themselves are not big. It's um, from 16 to 12 square meters. So very modest apartments and families were still big. Uh, but on the outside, you see that's very, very nice. And again, as soon as economy improved a bit, there was a change to bigger scale, because such scale, it's not socialist, you know, it's bourgeois. So what's more normal Soviet housing? So first, mid-rise, mid-rise, late 20s, early 30s, workers' settlements. Here you see poster with the slogan, let's transform Moscow into an exemplary socialist city of the proletarian state. It was published in 1930, and it's a pictogram of uh, a new housing development. What's important? What's important? That new housing should be close to the workplace. So the factory and uh, on the other side of the road, there is a housing development. At the same time, this new district should be connected with the uh, other parts of the city by public transport. You see here buses, trams, and taxis. Uh, next to the houses themselves, there should be sports grounds or open spaces for multi-purpose. And there is a club, workers club, for uh, cultural events and uh, further education. And in the background, you see a large building uh, which is called factory kitchen. F factory kitchen is the early Soviet phenomenon. It's a canteen on industrial scale. The idea was that women should be freed from uh, housework. They should work alongside men uh, in factories or offices. And instead of uh, preparing meals at home, families can go to a nearby canteen and quickly and inexpensively get their meals. And architecture itself is very, very, very simple. It's modernist with minimal details and uh, with flat roots, roofs. And you see that on this side, like normal grid of windows, but architects want to introduce ribbon windows on Le Corbusier model of modern architecture. But in reality, it was 
almost impossible because for even uh, windows uh, you need um, s steel skeleton and there was no almost no steel for construction at the period so most uh, housing and most buildings uh, tall were built with brick and the most elemental form is this linear plan with uh, narrow blocks parallel to each other but even in this case architect tried to do to make architecture more uh, interesting by introducing these sculptural corners. Uh, if you look at the master plan, you see that all the uh, residential buildings mm, organized around the public center with several public buildings and a garden. And here you have sports grounds, school and a kindergarten. So uh, all developments have to be integrated and have uh, good social infrastructure with all the necessary am amenities. This is one of the more interesting worker settlements. Shabalovka district in Moscow. You see the plan uh, in this case uh, houses, blocks are organized like in zigzag, zigzag shapes and form uh, rather small but interconnected courtyards of very nice human scale with playgrounds, with green areas, with some sports grounds. And in these photographs you can see that how uh, that walls of the houses were painted in different colors. It's black and white, but you can see the play of uh, dark and uh, light. And uh, we can judge that there were at least three colors, dark red, gray, and probably white. And uh, this wall painting is uh, dynamic and asymmetrical and it obviously connected with suprematist art. It's avant-garde architecture even it's quite simple. So you see it's architecture and art working together. It's another development of Pachtove Ulitsa but here uh, houses retained some of the original paint, maybe simplified from three to two uh, colors. And also you see that architect tried to introduce some simple but interesting elements. So part of the corner is rounded, part is sharp. Or here we see that in the corner of the building introduced a smaller volume of the kindergarten. And this is also a very typical element of architecture of the time, this corner bal balconies. This is the same development of Pachtove Ulitsa. And you can see the master plan. So very simple shapes of the buildings themselves made dynamics not only with paint and sculptural details but also with internal street which is bended and creates dynamic points of view as you move around it. Basically uh, residential houses of this time have very expressive corners, sculptural corners if uh, they uh, stand uh, on the intersection of the street, on the crossroads. But what, what was st standard about them? It was layouts of the apartments themselves. 
every year the planning office of the Moscow Council, so um, Moscow government, approved a set of standard apartment layouts. Uh, each year they were a bit different, maybe better or more economic. And uh, if you look at the plans, you see that the buildings themselves are quite narrow, so one apartment would look both sides on the street and you know, into the uh, courtyard. And it has uh, cross ventilation. Uh, there was considerable effort to make this housing uh, hygienic, you know, to have a lot of light and fresh air. We have to remember that there were still uh, not antibiotics or other modern way to fight uh, infections. So the housing conditions themselves have to help to people stay healthy. Very serious change happened in the mid 30s. Uh, first, uh, the, um, the, there was a change in, uh, in the uh, architectural policy. All the architects have to be members of the Union of Architects and uh, uh, follow the principle of socialist realism in architecture and also of adaptation of um, classical heritage. So no more modern architecture. Uh, this change came from the very top and it reflects a uh, personal taste of uh, Joseph Stalin. Uh, and in 1935, Moscow adopted a new master plan. We're talking about Moscow, but all other cities and even smaller town had to follow the example of the capital. So what, what happened? What happened with town planning and architecture and housing? Uh, there are some pictures from the book that explain it, this new master plan to the wider public. So this is part of the map of old Moscow. It's, it's small and crooked streets and side streets. And this is how Moscow should be, with wide uh, and straight streets wide and straight instead of narrow and crooked. And this new scale of the streets demanded new scale of architecture of buildings. For example, this is picture about reconstruction of the Gorky Street, now Tverskaya, the main street of the city. So this is before the reconstruction, rather narrow and with lower houses and this is new, much wider and with much taller buildings. Uh, this picture presents old capitalist Moscow as uh, the city of dwarf houses, dwarf buildings in 1912. Uh, each group of houses represents 10% of all the buildings in the city. So 50% in 1912 were one story, 40% two story, and less than 10% three story or taller. And of course, socialist city much, uh, must be on a much larger scale, much more modern, not dwarf at all. So. So, uh, in this picture you see the main building of Moscow and all the whole country, the palace of Soviets, the 400 meter 
uh, towers that was never built, but was planned. And all the city was planned around it and oriented to this palace of Soviets. And you see this new scale of buildings and of city blocks. And of course, most of this, uh, not most, but part of the city blocks is public buildings, but here, residential buildings. And here we are now. So, the whole city was to be rebuilt. Uh, no historical city fabric was designated to preservation, only individual uh, buildings. Uh, and that was what was happening in the late 30s and after the war till the mid-50s. This new scale of city blocks with large courtyards, uh, spacious and landscaped, and with residential buildings which were 8, 9 or 12 storey tall. From the outside, this architecture followed this policy of adaptation of classical heritage. Soviet people deserved the best of what history of architecture can offer. Uh, so many buildings were made to resemble uh, Renaissance, Renaissance palazzos, for example, but inside divided into apartments. You see that rustication uh, is uh, more pronounced uh, on the ground floor and uh, you see by the windows that the lower floor, ground floor is occupied by the stores or sometimes offices or libraries and services. And from the second floor we have apartments. Uh, if you look at the apartments it's themselves, they are more spacious than in the 20s. The um, rooms are bigger. Of course, they will always toilet and separate bathroom. Uh, but, but there were never enough housing for all. And most of these apartments be, uh, became communal apartments shared between several unrelated families. Only the top of the society, the Soviet elite, could occupy in, uh, one family apartments temporarily. So this is one of the better apartment houses for the Soviet elite uh, and uh, you see that, if you could see, I don't know, can you actually, but there is also uh, even the room for a maid next to the kitchen and the back stairs and two, three or even four rooms uh, in an apartment. Uh, and generally, uh, big apartment, it's three room, four rooms, it's extremely big apartment and no more. Okay. And blocks themselves became much wider and very often now uh, apartment look only on one side. So this is one and this is another no more cross ventilation. This is how it could look with a lot of detailing, uh, with rather imposing sp communal spaces and inside, inside uh, the apartment you uh, could see double, double doors and parquetting floors and large windows and modeled uh, uh, ceilings. 
another model for this period uh, is houses with central corridor. This solution allows to build less staircases. So here is bank of elevators and wide staircase and some space, some vestibule where uh, people who live in, in this floor could uh, gather, discuss something, not just uh, socialize. But then you have narrow and rather dark corridor with apartments to both sides and with very monotonous uh, placement of the walls. So it's simple, uh, relatively simple to build. But what we have inside, what we have inside? Entrance, hallway, kitchen, which is connected to a dining room and living room separated by double doors or even by moving uh, partition to this hall. So you can unite this and uh, have a reception, for example, here. And one bedroom with lots of, uh, of uh, built-in cupboards. So these apartments are among the best that were built during the Soviet period. But where can we put children uh, either together with uh, the parents or this living room serves as a bedroom for children? The same apartment with its built-in furniture, rather nice. Uh, in other cities, not in Moscow, not in Leningrad, but in smaller cities like Tver, the scale was smaller. So four-story, five-story uh, was a normal height for a residential building, even in this period, late 30s to mid 50s. So smaller city, smaller scale. And in 1955, there was the next radical change, next change in policy, because, you know, in 1953, Stalin died. The person who determined everything in the country, including architectural policy. And uh, by the in two years' time, his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, felt confident enough to introduce a radical change in uh, construction industry and, more specifically, in housing policy. Because all these uh, imposing residential buildings with spacious uh, and well-appointed apartments were not enough to house millions of people who continued to live in barracks, in uh, basements, uh, or in our crowded communal apartments. Something had to be done, and very quickly. So, uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, demanded uh, a radical transformation of the construction industry to uh, he ordered to build uh, factories for prefabricated elements and ordered architects, architectural offices to abandon all superfluous elements and to uh, design very simple, very cheap uh, residential buildings that could be built very rapidly. So cheap and easily built were the new main, new main um, qualities. And uh, first of all, mm. architects had to work more closely with engineers uh, and they looked back uh, not 
so much for the experience of the 20s, but abroad, abroad. One of the things that Khrushchev said, he said that architecture is not art. And it was very important in the 30s through 50s that architecture is high art. Be and um, city has to be a work of art. And Khrushchev says, no, architecture is technology. We have to do what's functional. And technology could be borrowed from abroad. Art, you have to make themselves. Technology, you can buy or you can steal even. And that's what, what was happened. And uh, Soviet uh, architects turned abroad, for example, and uh, in series for the uh, experiments that German architects did in the 20s and the 30s uh, about ex so-called existence minimum, so minimal dwelling, how small uh, apartment can be, how narrow a door can be, how low uh, the ceiling could be so you still be able to inhabit in the space. Uh, and the Soviet architects uh, visited several countries, you know, France, Holland, uh, Sweden, and looked into mass housing that was built after the Second World War, most with the same intention, and developed their own version of it. And you can see uh, how much smaller the normal apartment was. This is a French example. And you see that a uh, French architect for economic mass housing envisioned the normal family, average family, to have five children. And this apartment has this space for parents and five children. And Soviet architects had to build much cheaper and much smaller apartments. So this average family has one child only, and th this scheme shows how the apartment could be transformed uh, as child the child grew. So people basically couldn't afford to have more children or have to live again in cramped conditions again. This is uh, a model apartment, late 50s, this first stage of the industrial prefabricated construction. So this is an entrance hall combined bathroom and toilet, something that wasn't done before in Russia, mostly because the toilets still smell. There is kitchen and one room that's separated for areas for parents, child and the dining area with transformable furniture. The totally new model of furniture had to be developed alongside these minimal flats. And in these periods, uh, the Soviet construction industry had to follow the set of n norms and rules. And this first set of norms and rules ordered that the minimal kitchen can be 4.5 square meters. The ceiling could be as low as 2.5 meters. And uh, even four rooms uh, apartment can be only 40 meters, square meters in size. So this is a bit more generous uh, variant uh, with two rooms, two rooms that could house uh, four, uh, four people. But you still see that 
the staircase is uh, rather narrow, minimal entrance hall to four uh, apartments. One apartment look at on one side only. So everything is very modest. Again, in reality, uh, these apartments could house only, uh, not only parents and their children, but also a grandmother or grandmother and grandfather or aunt or something. So people had to be very inventive. But they still were very happy to move there from their communal apartments or basements. And architects envisioned that these very small apartments would be complemented by outside space. So outside space landscaped with different amenities where people would spend a lot of time. And initially the very popular uh, so-called uh, paddling pools, where you couldn't uh, really swim, but you could play with water in summer. And you see that architects uh, fitted every balcony with uh, uh, flower pots, flower boxes, and also envisioned this kind of uh, greenery outside. But all this failed because there were no system of maintenance of these uh, outdoor spaces. Uh, there was hope that people would uh, themselves tend to gardens, uh, and, they, and they didn't. Mm. And this kind of urban ideal never happened. But initially, initially everyone saw that people would be so friendly. So uh, what was the problem? You know, uh, construction workers were responsible only for the buildings themselves. As soon as buildings were completed, they left the area and landscaping was done later and mostly uh, with the help of school children who weren't uh, very enthusiastic about it, but were sent to plant some trees or flowers and um, so on. Uh, another problem with this kind of um, housing was that, well, the prefabricated elements were quite cheap and they could be assembled very quickly, but they need heavy machinery to assemble. They need these he heavy and expensive cranes. And also, the cranes need the space, uh, the, uh, like railroads. So it was impossible to preserve existing landscape and existing trees between the mm, houses. So people were very disappointed at first with the quality of these new districts uh, because all the plant infrastructure came uh, much later. But in time, in time, uh, trees uh, grew and uh, after the Soviet period there was proper maintenance and now these early industrial housing developments are rather nice and green and spacious. The next, uh, the next change in scale happened with the adoption of the next Moscow master plan in 1971. It was a much larger city with um, bisected with uh, uh, speed roads. It was a city for people who use not only public transport but also uh, private cars. Uh, and this big city grew in scale. And what changed in the industrial um, housing, prefabricated housing, that well, 
so it was a feeling that what was built before was very too monotonous. There should be uh, a possibility for uh, different kind of uh, buildings uh, for more variety. So uh, there was a plan to develop uh, a catalog, a prefabricated reinforced concrete elements. And architects could use these elements to construct very different types of buildings. And as a result, uh, there was developed a wide range of different apartment plans that could be combined. For example, like this. Also, the norms changed. So the kitchen could now be 8 to 10 meters, uh, square meters, and rooms and apartments themselves became bigger and sailings taller again. The norm was 2.75 uh, centimeters. Uh, so except this standard housing, there was so some experimental projects because architects had to plan for the future, for the communist future expected. Uh, this is one of these experimental uh, projects from the 70s where two slabs and two uh, towers sit on a common podium and underneath the, this podium is a parking space, underground parking. So people now own the cars and housing have to provide the space for this. And architects use this uh, prefabricated elements to uh, design different and uh, more comfortable apartments. And uh, the last project I want to show you, it's uh, from the 70s, it's a large district called North Chertanova, uh, which had all social infrastructure and you see that it had uh, residential buildings uh, rather tall and of uh, complex shape, very sculptural. And you see that uh, there is entrance to the underground parking. Inside, uh, inside the districts, uh, you could only come with uh, ambulance or taxi. All private cars or delivery had to go underground. So this is a plan for an under underground parking. And what's interesting, this is a range of services uh, the residents were provided. This is a hall on the ground floor of uh, the residential building. So this is a space for prams. This is a storage with uh, individual storage space for every apartment. And this is lockers for delivery. So people uh, don't have to spend time in shops. They could order all kind of goods by telephone. And during the day, these goods would be delivered into these lockers. Also, there were rather nice space where people could communicate uh, with each other. And uh, the buildings themselves now could have very complex and sculptural shape. But what happened in reality? construction industry dictated in terms. It's easy to build stan standard building, not experimental. So uh, very few types of buildings were reproduced thousands of times. The most popular of them is so-called P44, P44. So this one, late Soviet, and this is post-Soviet, and it's basically the same. It's uh, more, uh, uh, it's better uh, modification of the same series. It's called P44T, and it's still being constructed uh, today uh, in mass. And apartments themselves are better, more spacious, more comfortable. But what's happening? that now almost every family in big cities 
on a car and there is no space. The houses are tall, a number of families uh, living together is big, so all the courtyards, all the space around the cities are filled with cars. And that's the problem, one of the problems you have to solve. So this is it. So thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer any question you have. Uh, the first question uh, is, after the war, in the low-rise model, the private garden on, on each unit had a fundamental role. Well, uh, of course, during the war, there was gardening in the city. You know, people tried to grow their own food, so they understood better uh, the importance of a private garden. But in reality, this uh, individual cottages with gardens were built in the smaller cities. There were district of in smaller cities with one or two family cottages with private gardens. Uh, in bigger cities, there were low-rise developments uh, with no individual gardens, with a communal courtyard which was not uh, used for growing uh, vegetables or fruits, but they were, they were fruit um, trees, uh, apple trees mostly. So uh, the second question. At some point of housing development in Russia, it was implemented regulations, rules that specify type colors and building facades. Uh, not really, not, not really, not code. Mm, there was guidelines, guidelines uh, in the mid-70s that it is desirable to introduce some color into the walls of the buildings. There were different solutions I didn't show you, but in uh, many cases, the end sides uh, uh, of, uh, of a block could be covered by um, a mural or a mosaic. And um, uh, the construction factories started to put some color into uh, external panels, wall panels. And uh, so the n variations uh, were not very big, but they were not regulated by rules, but rather but what individual factory decide to produce. Uh -huh. The second question, yes, that's a very good question, about uh, sun exposure rules. Uh, the norms of sun exposure were introduced in the 20s. That was one of the first uh, results of this uh, scientific uh, research in housing. And uh, so, and then they were changed several times, but normally that uh, the rules uh, were that from this 22nd of March to the 22nd of September, uh, at least one room in, in a flat should have direct sunlight for at least two hours. Uh, that means that no uh, apartment could be mm, facing north. So at least one room should be uh, uh, oriented differently to get direct sunlight. Uh, next, can you provide more information about structural system from the past till now? And also what about the Duchess till now? Well, the question about the Duchess I think deserves more time than I have, but what about structural systems? Well, uh, 
Well, historically, of course, that was brick, uh, but uh, already in the 20s uh, there were some cases uh, of using reinforced concrete uh, in experimental uh, uh, experimental uh, projects. So, uh, reinforced concrete or steel skeleton with uh, non-load-bearing walls already in the twen 20s. Uh, but I think that your question uh, refers mostly to the period of in industrial construction from the uh, mid 50s. Uh, originally, originally in the um, 50s and 60s, uh, the goal was to uh, minimize time on the construction site. So everything has to be pre prefabricated and ready to be assembled. Uh, this is why most houses were four or five story high only. So it doesn't, uh, they doesn't need to have uh, a skeleton, doesn't have to need uh, much steel. So only panels for walls and ceilings could, that could be very quickly and easily assembled on site. Yeah, on site. Uh, another variant is uh, blocks. I'll show you the blocks. The whole rooms were uh, made um, in the factory and then assembled on site. And of course this kind of construction is very quick, but it's very difficult to transport the whole block from the factory to the construction site, and this kind of crane is much more expensive and difficult to operate than this one. So this block construction wasn't very uh, well, um, very widespread. Uh, and on this picture you see that a taller building has some skeleton. So uh, some load-bearing elements and some uh, isolating panels, but mostly panels. Uh, the brick construction after the 60s uh, uh, was used either in a smaller cities where there are no construction factories or in bigger cities where uh, restricted for the best housing. We call them SECA buildings for central committee meant, meant for uh, party officials or members of governments and their families. So it was kind of elite housing. Uh, but th um, if, it's th if the building is tall, it has steel skeleton, reinforced concrete uh, floors and uh, brick uh, external walls. Ah. Developments in the last 50 years happened in micro rayons and only historic block urbanism is from the Stalin era. If the current plan from Moscow that cons consists of block urbanism. As far as I know, the current policy, yes, is to reintroduce the urban block, to replace micro rayon with uh, active uh, street front and closed courtyards. Uh, but I don't think it's very realistic. So I think that part of new development will co would consist from the city blocks, but I don't think that they will replace uh, existing micro rayons or even that it's 
desirable because the microrayon model has its advantages. Uh, the sunrooms at common areas is something considered luxury item in building construction. We are not sure. We are not sure what do you mean by sunrooms, uh, if it's glazed terrace or uh, large balconies. You know, uh, normally, uh, I mean, for the last 40 years, normally each apartment has a balcony. So, uh, and uh, in recent years, most people prefer the balconies glazed, so it's additional space. So it's not a luxury item, but large terrace, uh, yes, it's not something that uh, hap happens very often. Engineer networks is a tendency toward local heating stations for us uh, running off natural gas, for instance, instead of centralized. Well, in cities, it's still mostly centralized heating. Yes, uh, only in suburbia. Okay, so I think we uh, the time's up, and uh, uh, there is more questions that I had time to answer. But uh, all your questions will be answered later via email. So thank you for your attention, and good luck with the competition. <laughs>